My name is Motze. Uh, I, I'm a consultant at Demon, and I'll be a host for this evening. Unfortunately, the regular host of these evenings, uh, Hugh Evans, could not make it, but I'll be standing in for him. Hopefully, that's okay. okay. So, as I said, uh, my name is uh, Motze Lehata, and I am a I'm a consultant at, at Demon. So uh, Demon are the, we co-sponsor we, we co this uh, regular meetup. Um, yeah, so this is a monthly meetup uh, covering AI and uh, deep learning and enterprise. If you would like to speak at any one of our, uh, at any one of our events, uh, please scan the QR code and yeah, sign up with your topic. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Uh, before we get started, I um, just want to again invite you to scan the QR code and have a look at our code of conduct. I think uh, as um, well, these, these meetups are going long before I joined, uh, but my understanding is the community keeps growing and growing, and you know, as we grow, we want to sort of preserve the, the welcoming nature um, of our meetup. So I would urge you all to scan this, read our code of conduct, and uh, please abide by that. Basically, just be respectful to everyone. And um, yeah, I think we'll have a great time. Yeah. So your presenter, so, yeah. so your presenter this evening will be John Sandal, the CEO and uh, principal data scientist at Coefficient, and he'll be talking about uh, yeah, investigating the use of AI tools and hiring and recruitment. And your second speaker will be, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, and Andreas Parotsis. I hope I got that right. Well done. Thank you. Um, Andreas is the head of ca head of AI capability at uh, Ten Downing Street, and he'll be speaking about measuring bias and impact in gut AI. Um, but before we get to all, all that super exciting stuff, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Demon. So Demon is a data consultant. Yeah. We are a software consultancy based in Paddington, in London. Uh, we're a small company of about two hundred people. And uh, so we have a number of practices, including you know, software engineering, cloud engineering, DevOps, and data, AI, and ML, which is the practice that I'm from. Our head of practice, Ian Ray, uh, could not be here today, um, but I'd love to tell you a little bit about what we do. So we have, I suppose I'll start telling you about what we do by telling you about what we do for some of our clients. So we work for a number of clients in the, in the retail and insurance space. As well as number of, as well as number of uh, smaller startups. Uh, for our larger retail clients, we do things like set up, uh, yeah, we set up data warehouses, as we yeah, as well as data engineering pipelines. And for our startup clients, who we we have a, we work with AWS Startup Labs to help them with uh, to help them getting their proof of concepts off the ground. So, for example, for one of our clients recently, um, Nomi, we help them build an an LLM, an LLM driven chatbot. Um, so this allowed you to sort of this allowed you to do a have a real time well, have a real time conversation with an avatar that was backed by an LLM. So we built that entire infrastructure out for them and helped them basically upscale their product up and get it up to market. Uh, <clears throat> so to learn a little bit more about us, uh, we also publish a number of uh, yeah we have a blog where we publish quite a lot of articles. We also publish routinely on LinkedIn. So our, one of our latest articles is around uh, meetups, funnily enough. So yep, so we have a, some of our consultants got together and uh, gave their perspectives on why we feel meetups are so important to the tech ecosystem. And, what, yeah, and we also talk a little bit about um, how we do our part to encouraging um, the culture of meetups. It's especially important for us given that we're a remote first company so we have people uh, all throughout England. Uh, we have a guy, we have someone in Turkey, and we also have a small team in South Africa. So for us, um, yeah, these meetups are an opportunity we actually get to get together. It's especially important, you know, with that remote first. Yes. If anything I said has excited you, uh, please scan this QR code. We're currently hiring across a number of roles. So on the technical side, we have. We have uh, we're hiring uh, a number of consultants in our data, ML, and AI practice across a number of levels. Uh, so we're hiring uh, consultants and senior consultants. And then in our engineering and cloud practices, we are hiring uh, consultants, senior consultants, as well as principal consultants. 
We also have a number of uh, non-technical roles that we're hiring in, including a business development manager and a client director. So if any of these sound like they're up your alley, uh, yeah, scan the QR code and look forward to having a conversation with you soon. The QR code has expired. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in this case, uh, dae.mn slash openings. Um, I will be sure to put up a new QR code. Apologies for that. <laughs> um, yeah, and with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our first talker, uh, John Sandal. Hello, is this loud enough? Can everybody hear me okay? Very good. Um, so I've been asked to also just do a quick intro to uh, Newspeak House as well. So um, I'd love to know just a little bit about you who have come along today. So um, if you have been to Newspeak House before, put your hand up. It's a little bit interactive. Very good. So welcome back. Um, and I assume that everyone else is your first time. Um, if you are a fellow of Newspeak House, put your hand up. Yeah, any fellows in the room? Okay, a couple. Um, and faculty, it's myself as well. Very good. Um, so, in terms of your backgrounds, I'd just love to know sort of the industries that you work in. So, um, who, who is coming from background in academia predominantly? Hand up. So, some academics in the room. Okay. Uh, anyone coming from the world of journalism? Okay, not yet. Next time, maybe. Um, who, who is coming from uh, the world of industry? That's most of you. Okay. Um, keeping your hands up if you're in IT, uh, uh, consulting. Um, uh, what other industry verticals do we have in the room? Uh, shout out to me. Where, where are we from today? Government. Government. Okay, who's here from public sector? <laughs> okay, a few of you. Okay, and if you haven't put your hand up, um, tell me where, where, where you've come from. What's your background? At the back? Is that, you're just scratching your skull. <laughs> it's okay. So it's a mixture of industry, government, non-profit, third sector, and that sort of mix is very typical um, at Newspeak. Every single time you come here, if you look at the, the website, um, I can't remember the real one, but newspeak.house also works, um, you'll see there's a huge list of events. And uh, as a fellow, uh, you get the absolute privilege of spending six months of your life living in the floors above here. And you see the wide, wide world of, uh, as, as it says on the cards in front of you, uh, civic communities. But that could be people that care about uh, the future of journalism, risks from AI. It could be uh, people that uh, are wondering where this whole like blockchain stuff is all going. And um, it's people that care about how do we use data for good or AI for good? How do we use technology to help communities of practice? How do we nurture communities of practice? So it's about technology, but it's about people as well. Um, the fellowship scheme, if anybody is interested in this idea of spending six months living in this institution, attending all the events, meeting, a just an amazing cross-section of society of people that are just uh, looking to understand the world. House, and uh, you can find out what the fellowship program is all about. It is it is amazing opportunity uh, to to learn learn from the faculty. We run modules, we teach courses, we coach, we we mentor uh, you to try and uh, sort of do something wonderful. So uh, do check out the website. Um, but uh, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, for hosting uh, this event and you speak. So um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is John. I'm the CEO of Coefficient. Uh, we are also a, uh, a consultancy, AI consultancy, work a lot in the public sector. We are builders. Okay? We build machine learning systems. A lot of what we're doing these days is we build machine learning systems for government, whether it's the FCDO, law enforcement, MOJ and beyond. We are building these systems. And again, just quick hands up, who here builds AI systems? Right. So. We know the power of AI, it can do amazing things. It can uh, improve productivity, it can save time, it can do things more efficiently, it can do things better. Uh, but also we might have that nagging feeling of, you know, are we building things that might do bad? And how do we even know, how do we measure that? So this is what this project has all been about. And uh, this talk it's itself uh, has come out of a funded program from at the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology. Uh, they funded the Fairness Innovation Challenge. And so this is one of uh, the talks that we've given to sort of start sharing back into the world what we've learned, engaging the world of AI fairness. So we'll start with a little bit of background, a little bit of history. Does anybody know roughly what year or decade the first real 
incident uh, of discrimination in the workplace? What do we think? Do we think it's sort of 80s, 70s, 60s, <coughs> earlier? Shout out. Earlier. Lala? Earlier. Earlier, yes, very much earlier. So, the first real big starting point, the, the starting gun for this entire world of fairness and discrimination in the workplace was the 1950s. Duke's Power, uh, the Down River Steam Station in North Carolina, a lot of these stories are US based, um, and we'll come back to that. Uh, they effectively had policies that restricted their black employees to certain departments, the departments that didn't have the best paying jobs. And uh, this uh, this was considered you know, maybe, maybe not ideal, uh, but there's no reason why they can't do that in the 1950s. And in 1955, uh, they went a step further, they mandated requiring a high school diploma uh, for employment in any other departments, knowing that that would, again, bias those sorts of people, the black employees, out of being able to get those roles as well. Now, in 1965, the Civil Rights uh, Act uh, takes, uh, takes effect. And that very same day, they adapted their policies to comply with the Civil Rights Act uh, by adding an aptitude test and an IQ test. Funnily enough, they had exactly the same effect of, uh, of making it very hard for those black employees to get jobs in the other higher paying departments. Uh, but they complied with the Civil Rights Act. A great example of how organisations could just adapt their policies to meet the regulation of the day, keeping the same discrimination in place. However, Supreme Court got involved. Uh, these things take time, five years, six years uh, in the making, but they ruled in favour, a huge landmark ruling, ruling in favour of, uh, 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 of, 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 of establishing this uh, idea of the disparate impact doctrine. And they decided that these employment practices, even if not provably designed to be discriminatory, if you can measure them, and it turns out that they are discriminatory, then this is now unlawful. And if these tests are not related to job performance, they're things like IQ aptitude, they're not directly related to performance, again, that is one of the things they'll take into account. So it puts the burden of proof on employers to justify the practices, the hiring practices that they have. And uh, this, is, this has become a landmark ruling. A lot of things have since uh, been designed around this idea of the disparate impact measure. We'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, what about AI? So does anybody know when the world's first AI hiring scandal was? It's recent? Was it back in the 40s? What did we think? Give me something. 1970s. 1970s, you're very close. Do you know where it was? Harvard. Not Newspeak, but it was in London. Okay, so, uh, 1979. And this is St. George's Hospital. They implemented, this is not actually St. George's, I've just used AI to make this a little bit more entertaining. Uh, so they used a, a natural language processing algorithms in 1979, like these things exist, we had computers, and they trained them on their previous hiring decisions uh, for their medical graduation program. And the NLP programs, like they learned all of the keywords and terminology that were associated with the people who'd been historically favoured and given roles in the graduate medical program at St. George's Hospital here in London. And it turns out that maybe some of that training data uh, was somewhat biased in terms of people who were accepted versus not accepted. And maybe it was fair, maybe it was not fair, but it definitely the AI system landed on certain keywords that were directly related to the people that didn't get it. And then it included those systemically into its hiring decisions. So what happened? Uh, they, they built a computer-based admission system. Uh, then it turned out, and it was an internal investigation by those lecturers, those people who were working inside uh, the system, who thought, you know, we're building this stuff, but maybe it's not ideal, maybe it's doing harm. Which, again, for the machine learning developers in the room, like, let's really continually ask that of ourselves with the systems that we built. And uh, basically, if it saw that you had a non-European name, or that maybe you came from the wrong part of London, or that if you were just a woman, then it would disadvantage you um, in its scoring uh, outcomes. And it was also very accurate, it was 95% accurate at replicating uh, previous hiring decisions. So high performance, wildly unfair. Now what happened, uh, the Commission for Racial Equality, uh, the predecessor to the EHRC, uh, they investigated uh, to their credit in 1988, uh, they found that definitely it had unfairly rejected 
a bunch of applicants, and they concluded that uh, St. George's had violated the Race Relations Act. Definitely not good. What happened? Not a lot. Uh, there was no fines, uh, there was uh, a requirement to redesign the system. Uh, I guess the good thing is this definitely changed how hiring and admissions processes worked across the entire university and academic and tertiary sector here in the UK. Uh, now information is collected on your demographic information and background uh, so that evaluation and analysis can be done to see if hiring systems are uh, discriminative. And that's become a lot more widespread, uh, widespread across government and many enterprise organisations as well will do this as part of uh, you know, good practice. But no, other than a PR incident that not many people know about, no really bad uh, things happen to St George's as a result of all of this. And that's worth bearing in mind because if this is happening today with modern AI, then what's, what's, what's the reason to care about if you're doing really bad uh, illegal things? Well, in fact, maybe there, is, there isn't much at the moment. If you want to uh, find out more about uh, all these wonderful, uh, well, non-wonderful AI incidents that happen, there's a very good website uh, I can recommend called the AI Incident Database, and uh, there's just loads and stuff. So if you want to just sort of a, a daily or weekly dose of uh, terrible things happening in the world of AI every week, there's your website. So moving on in time, uh, 2015, and a really, uh, a really interesting story, not necessarily around uh, just AI being bad, but a particular instance that you can start to watch out for if you see uh, if you see the, the, the possibility for feedback loops occurring then it becomes so much worse exponentially worse so how does this work um, in 2015 uh, there was a, a story by the Washington Post they found that uh, Google's algorithm for job adverts uh, was showing more prestigious job ads to men but not to women and back in the time uh, you could also search on Google Images this is sort of a canonical example people give algorithms are biased uh, and you search CEO and you get a very particular kind of person, often with glasses. <laughs> and yes, they've changed that now because they've been called out on this sort of stuff so much, uh, but the practice still stood at the time, uh, especially in the job adverts and who they were being shown to. Now, here's where this gets really bad. It's the idea of negative feedback loop. So if Google thinks you're a female, you will see fewer ads for the high paying roles. And that is proven. There's a, there's a wonderful study, um, I'll, I'll share these slides um, online afterwards, um, or, or come and speak to me, but uh, the, the study is referenced in the bottom there. So this is proven. And uh, oh, here's the study as well. So therefore, you're going to start getting fewer job offers, because if you're not seeing the jobs, then you're not going to be applying to those jobs as much. And again, this is not as much an individual thing. This stuff happens and is immeasurable in the end. So in the aggregate, women are seeing less job offers for high paying roles, they're applying less, and therefore they're getting those job offers, uh, jobs less. Therefore, we enter into a world where increasingly women are getting less job experience, uh, marginally, but due to an AI system that exists in the world. That means you become less employable than your male peers, it means that the historical data that builds up over time uh, starts to validate the decisions of the AI system uh, not to show the high paying roles to women because it turns out in its training data uh, women aren't getting those roles as much anyway it turns out and so the algorithm gets this feedback loop encoded where it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse unless someone is looking out for it and can put in some uh, some way to mitigate that unfair bias and you notice by the way I'm using the word unfair bias a lot today all algorithms are biased they have weights and they have bias. Like that's the fundamentals of most machine learning algorithms. Uh, so without biased algorithms, we, we would just have algorithms that like, make up random numbers. So bias is important, but unfair bias is what we're talking about today. Just want to make that point. And so the cycle starts again. We see similar patterns in credit scoring, stop and frisk policies, predictive policing, and definitely in hiring. So moving in, what happens in the world of hiring? Amazon did some pretty interesting fruity things uh, in, in this time period. <coughs> to their credit, they talked about it, uh, or, or somehow, uh, this got out into the news. Uh, and I guess eventually, after a good three years of this, they scrapped it, but they were definitely using this for a while. And what they did, they tried to build an AI, they did what St. George's Hospital did back in the 1979, uh, they trained it in all of their hiring data, one of the things that I think maybe is not great is they were intending for the, to, to try and remove humans from the decision-making loop of hiring. They wanted the AI to be entirely self-sufficient and automated in terms of screening and hiring. 
And I'm not sure if that's the right goal, uh, even even with the better AI that we have today, especially with the better AI that they have today. I don't think that we should try and remove humans uh, from these processes entirely. So they wanted it to be an engine where you give it 100 resumes, it gives you the top five, and uh, you, you save some time, I guess, and they just hire them. And it found out that women were being penalised. Literally just the word woman or a female name in your CV would drop your score uh, just, just on that. And there were other indicators as well that, uh, that indicated, again, unfair bias within these AI systems. So more recently, this is a great case study because it is an example of regulation and new government uh, intervention having some kind of impact to do better. But it is only $365,000 plus the payout for a class action lawsuit, which is a pretty small sum for a company that is making a lot more than that in terms of revenue. But what happened? In 2022, uh, the US is relatively new, EEOT, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, they sued iTutor Group. Now, iTutor Group is a uh, Chinese company. This is important not because of anything about like the culture of Chinese companies versus other companies, but because in China, your retirement age is at 55 if you're a woman and 60 if you're a man. So again, in that training data, there is a cliff edge of should you hire the person or not based on their gender and age. And that's important because that was, and I don't know this for sure, I'm just reading between the lines of the news stories, probably encoded in their system, when a, uh, the, the, the first woman who started the class action lawsuit realized if she just dropped her age from above 55 to below 55, suddenly she was getting a lot more callbacks uh, for, for interviews. And so it was provable. That's really important to remember here. This is an example where the, the AI is so, so particularly biased with a very, very uh, sort of specific drop off point that you could demonstrate it and you could prove it and you could replicate it. With, and you could therefore find other people who had fallen foul of this exact uh, flaw in the AI algorithm. So the EEOC finds that they uh, violated the Age of Discrimination and Employment Act. Uh, they, they had really good evidence to back this up. They could demonstrate it, they could prove it, they could take the algorithm and show, show in a court of law that this algorithm definitely is, uh, is, is making illegal uh, hiring decisions. And uh, Eventually, after years of legal wrangling, I tried to have this thrown out of court multiple times, uh, but there was a, a payout. Now, this is across 200 people, affected, uh, affected applicants. So again, that's not a lot across 200 people, and it's not a lot for a large organization as a slap on the wrist. So what does it take in 2024 to get companies to care about this? Again, I don't know, because if this is the worst that's going to happen, then there's not that much in terms of incentives. A small incentive, but not that much. I, and that's my fear. You also have to be able to have the perfect scenario where you can prove it and replicate it with a really, really specific cutoff on age. And I don't think that's what we're going to be seeing with AI systems of today or the future. But it's world first in uh, an AI hiring uh, regulatory uh, success story. So what can we do about this? Now. A little bit of history in terms of uh, how we research and measure bias and unfair bias in the world. Uh, a seminal paper uh, from 2003, uh, it wasn't looking at AI systems, it was looking at just recruitment overall. And it was a paper, are Emily and Greg more employable than Lakisha and Jamal? And they had a field experiment. They made up a load of fictitious resumes, they sent them uh, to, to lots of organizations uh, to help wanted ads in Boston, Chicago, and uh, they had either white sounding or African-American sounding names. If you want to dive into the methodology of that, uh, definitely check out the paper. But they've tried to be very rigorous in aligning, based on statistics and data, what white sounding and African-American sounding names are. And what they found is that uh, resumes with white sounding names get 50% more callbacks than those with African-American names. Uh, that uh, the higher, if you take a high quality and a low quality CV and you slap a white name on it, uh, but again, they get 30% more callbacks, so there's diminishing returns uh, for the African-Americans as they get more credentials. Uh, that applicants from better neighborhoods, regardless of the rest of their, their, their skills, qualities, and experience, uh, were receiving more callbacks. Uh, uh, that uh, people, organizations, contractors who say they are equal opportunity employers were actually no different uh, to the ones who didn't, uh, and that the discrimination was consistent across every industry and occupation. So this has become sort of a very good methodology for how we can measure discrimination in the workplace. And again, like, this is happening. Uh, it's happening in the UK, 
uh, because DWP funded uh, something very, very similar, it, it, almost a replication of this entire study in 2009. They commissioned the National, National Center for Social Research uh, to, again, do a very similar study. It was a fieldwork study. They sent resumes to organizations. Uh, they switched up the names to ethnic minorities, much more UK focused in terms of how they were approaching this as well. And again, looked at the differences in interview callbacks. And found that uh, the white applicants were receiving a lot more positive responses, 68% compared to ethnic minorities at 39%. Uh, so a 29% uh, net discrimination. And remember this, this is a measure of unfairness in hiring. A net discrimination in favour of white applicants. Now, how did they do this? This is kind of interesting because what we are now doing at Coefficient with this decent funding is we're replicating this, but not just for real humans and real organisations, but with AI systems, which has not yet been done in the UK. So we wanted to know how do they do this, and uh, what they did, they actually made loads and loads of uh, fake CVs, uh, like proper CVs, and they, they manually just sort of injected uh, different clues in terms of location or age or gender and so on. Um, they had a bunch of different job roles that they were applying to. Uh, the way that they conveyed racial identity, again, a very rigorous process, uh, quite, quite sort of fascinating to find out about. So, they selected names uh, that were associated with specific ethnic groups. Uh, again, this is sort of, in America, they just talk about black and white in, in a lot of these studies. In the UK, uh, it was about black, African, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, white, often there's also white other, uh, so white British and white father, for example, Irish, uh, used to be uh, quite uh, quite heavily discriminated against in the history of this research. And then they, they, they took that long, long list and they, they reduced that down through internal testing. So they actually um, got people within the NATSEM uh, to indicate what do you think, you know, what the ethnicity of this name is. And uh, where they had a very, very strong percentage of people saying, yes, we think this is a, for example, Bangladeshi name, then they would sort of put a tick in that and say, yeah, probably this is a go. But then they, they validated that even further. Uh, by doing YouGov survey polling, uh, they had uh, 650 people just double down on that to really, really get high confidence that a certain name was perceived by individuals as uh, pertaining to a uh, sort of a particular ethnic identity. And they, they, these are the sort of names they come up with. Um, and in fact, I think these are the only names that we use. They basically had one name for each um, gender and ethnic group combination. So again, like, kind of interesting to see how this can work out. So then, fast forwarding to 2024, and a really interesting study. Uh, this is a Bloomberg article, and uh, I'm just going to walk you through how they did this. At this point, it's going to feel very familiar. It's very similar to the non-AI studies that have existed, uh, but they uh, threw all of this stuff at OpenAI to see, okay, how biased is OpenAI as a CV screening tool? Because a lot of recruiters, we know recruiters, are using this. It saves a ton of time to just take those CVs, throw it into ChatGPT and get it to rank the CVs. And then they'll take the top few and then they'll, uh, they'll recommend those to their clients. So we know this is happening because the, just the power and time saving uh, is amazing. But it's definitely racially biased. So how did they do this? Uh, similar idea, again, this is US focused this time. Uh, so these uh, public data, uh, virtual data, you have this in the US. Uh, they're able to derive 800 distinct names uh, across four different ethnic groups, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian. Uh, to prove uh, or to use statistically linked names for each ethnicity. Then they generated a bunch of resumes. I think this was eight identical resumes for four different job roles. And then they just switched out the names of, of these resumes and then threw it into ChatGPT over and over and over and over again. Uh, so random pairing names and uh, the job descriptions. I think they had a, a finance role, a software engineering role, a US uh, retail manager role, and an HR role. Remember, because actually it's really important. Uh, it turns out these AI systems aren't just generic, they are a bit generically biased, but they're very biased for different roles and they bias in different directions depending on the role. For example, the software engineering role, certain demographic groups are preferred, but those groups don't fare well in the HR role, which if you think about it, makes sense. <coughs> like, that is a thing that humans are likely to do as well and open AI systems have learned uh, these biases. So then they prompt, ChatGPT, in this case, they, they looked at GPT 3.5 and 4, and uh, they asked it to rank the following eight resumes for the most qualified candidate for the following role. Here's a job description, and it spits out their ranking. And then they do that again and again and again, repeating it a thousand times per role. And they tell you the results. Again, beautiful visualization. Thank you, Bloomberg. 
for making my life very easy in presenting this. And then they tally all of that together and they start calculating those disparate impact metrics. And it begins to look a little bit like this. So here is one job description. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side here, I think this is the HR role, uh, that Asian women are uh, selected far more often than at the bottom you have black men. So there is a huge bias coming in here uh, from OpenAI. And in this particular job role, it's preferring the Asian women uh, above all other demographic groups. And we can measure that. We can put a number to it. And another way of framing this is, OK, if, uh, if the best treated group is at 100%, uh, how, much, how often are the other groups getting selected in comparison? So again, it's just a different way of framing the same numbers, um, it's just normalizing it out a bit. But we find out that black men are uh, ranked first 44% of the time compared to Asian women. Or another way of thinking about this, Asian women are being selected sort of 2.3 times more often than the black men for this role, given the exact same CV, skills, and experience. So we can see how this uh, compares across all the different roles they looked at. You've got um, for HR specialists, Hispanic women do very well, white men. Uh, uh, are now at the bottom. Uh, for the financial analyst, Asian women at the top, black men at the bottom. Uh, for the software engineering role, uh, white women are doing very well here, and black women very much not well. So sometimes this, this uh, actually contradicts maybe what you would guess. Is it just about men versus women? It's much more about ethnicity. And other research that we've seen uh, actually indicate that age is actually the much bigger dimension of discrimination. Uh, uh, if you are a older black woman, you are far less likely to be getting your software engineering job uh, if the AI is doing the choosing. And why is this happening? Well, because again, these names are encoded in embeddings within the model. Uh, you can see this, you can actually just see the embedding itself and visualize it, and it makes it really obvious that yes, these names are linked to all sorts of other things which are then encoded for uh, you know, within OpenAI's world model within the LLM. So, what's next? What are we doing about this? First of all, um, the coefficient, as I mentioned, it's being funded uh, by uh, DSIT uh, as part of their AI Fairness Innovation Challenge. There's a few other areas, not just recruitment, but they're looking at healthcare and other areas of fairness and bias. Uh, so there's, a, there's an event coming up in October, and therefore I cannot say anything about what we found out so far um, until after October, but hopefully we'll be coming back and talking about some of our outcomes from the research that myself and my team, including Preeti here, uh, are doing. But we can't say anything until then. It's under embargo. Uh, but we know that 72% of CVs uh, today are never seen by a human eye. Uh, they're just being sifted through. There's a lot of systems. If you have an applicant tracking system for your workplace, have a look at the features it offers. It might have an AI recruiter. It might have a way that it can just do sourcing for you. So how do those CVs just appear in your inbox? I've got questions. Uh, they will claim to have uh, sort of privacy features or fairness features like data masking. But like masking all the PII does not stop this. There are so many other things that encode for your uh, demographic groups and protected characteristics. For example, um, if you, uh, the, the university you went to uh, might indicate uh, something about your, your demographic background or class. If we compare that with the uh, societies that you went to in that university, if you went to a religious society, also the year of graduation, okay, are they masking that? I don't think so, but that indicates your age. And again, uh, these AI tools will see that, and if they think, yeah, you're probably too old for this role, they won't put you through. So we are, we are replicating these studies. The, the things that I'm talking about, the Bloomberg article, uh, some of these DWP, uh, we're replicating these studies at the moment. Very excited to tell you about some of what we're finding, which just doubles down on what I've seen so far, which is these systems are very, very biased. Um, I'd love to tell you which LLM is the worst, and there is one out there that is a very popular, but I cannot tell you until after October, but we'll be back. One really, really good recommendation, though, um, is this book. If you're interested in all this, the F. Brown with them by uh, Michael Kearns and Aaron Roth. Um, they, again, go into some of how this happens. Uh, the word embeddings uh, exhibit gender bias. So, again, you can see sort of ladies is to nephew as earrings is to genius. Like, those are sort of meant to be the same uh, distance and, uh, and vector direction. And that's, well, not ideal. Maybe we can train these systems a bit better. We know the marketing is not the answer. As I've just mentioned, there are so many ways that you can infer someone's protected characteristics. In fact, our partners on this, uh, Bayes Consulting, uh, who again will be coming back to Newsweek House when we present our results, um, they've done previous work with the NHS where they found that the style of language also encodes some of your protected characteristics, especially 
older people write different to younger people. You use different words, you use different grammar, you use punctuation differently. So even that alone is enough for an LLM to sort of have some guesses and then put that on top of all of its other biases and think, eh, maybe we don't want you because you write too uh, differently. So one final really um, useful tool that we've come across when having conversations, because we are um, lucky enough to have conversations with the regulators, with the ICO, with the HRC, uh, to, to present some of what we're finding back to them, because they kind of have to be a part of the solution here, maybe. Uh, but a good tool to think about this is uh, there was a Pareto front between error and unfairness, and uh, uh, this has been proven in lots of different uh, scenarios. And so what this is showing, just to walk you through this diagram, is that if you have a model that's right on the top, uh, the bottom right, then uh, that has very high error. It doesn't fit the training data. It's almost maybe just a random number generator, uh, but also it has very low unfairness. So it's very, it's not discriminative, which is probably accurate. It's, if it's a random number generator, it's definitely not discriminative. And if you have a model that's on the top left, then that has low error. Uh, the machine learning engineers are probably like <coughs> celebrating because they've absolutely smashed it out of the park. Their ML model metrics are, are, are incredibly good with very low error, but also the Pareto front indicates that that is probably the model with the most amount of unfairness baked into it. Especially if your training data has loads of unfairness and discriminatory, in this case, hiring practices, then yes, your model is now really well matching your training data, which means it's really good at replicating the historical biases of your human teeth. Maybe not ideal. But as far as we're concerned, as machine learning engineers, we call that optimal. And so, in reality, most models are not on the curve. In fact, I think this is a good thing. There is an opportunity to improve our models. But in which direction? Because we could actually just say, you know, if I was working with, uh, with one of these AI tools, I could make them a pitch. I could say, we well, can use, uh, there are various bias mitigation libraries out there. You've got Microsoft's Fairlearn. You've got the IBM AI Fairness 360 framework. Uh, you've got Google's What If framework. And new uh, libraries are coming online every year for bias or debiasing AI systems. And again, like I could do another 45 minutes on just how to debias AI systems, but I won't do that. Maybe come to my meetup, Pi Data London at some point, and you can hear about the technical weeds about there. But if you can debias systems, and you can to a little bit, not perfectly, but you can a little bit, uh, then you can move towards that Pareto front, which means you've reduced your unfairness, that's good, but there's no difference in error. So the AI tool shouldn't really care about that, because you're not making it worse. You're keeping it same performance in terms of the error metrics, but you're definitely making it a lot fairer. So that is a useful thing that we could do if we were incentivized to do it. But I don't think these organizations, companies building this stuff, are incentivized to do it. I think they'll look at their model metrics and say, yeah, actually, if we just go in this direction, uh, then you know what, we'll, uh, we'll have better models, and then we've got better stats for our funding slides, and uh, we'll get a bigger funding round from our VCs next time around, because our AI systems are much better. Maybe. I would like to see a world where we can incentivize going sort of in this direction. Now. But I don't know how we do that. And, and just to say, like, this isn't just a made up thing, like, this has been validated. So, again, read the book if you want to know. There are lots of scenarios and data sets where this Pareto front um, has been proven. So, some closing thoughts. How bad is the harm? Uh, I think at the moment, probably actually just quite low, because AI systems are not massively widespread from what we can tell. Uh, we've identified as part of our research work with DISA uh, dozens of AI tools that are used in um, the recruitment sector. So we know there's loads of them out there, but uh, we're not sure how much they're really being used. Uh, your applicant tracking system might have an AI recruiter, but you may not be using it at all. So maybe it's low at the moment, but as these systems become more useful, as recruitment agencies uh, really start doubling down on, hey, we can save a ton of time, uh, and still have the same outcomes if we use AI, which of course they will, then I think this will get a lot worse. The scale of the problem will increase uh, alongside the usage and our, uh, adoption of AI. But these harms are not individual. They are completely systemic. Like the AI system is not just, uh, it's not like a group of biased people existing in the world, biasing in various uh, directions and discriminating against different people. Like this is now one system that discriminates against, for example, uh, like older black women all in one go, like, they don't have a chance now if that one system is being used and it just really, really biases systemically against them. So that is a different world of discrimination, a different level of discrimination uh, once these tools start becoming adopted. But it's hard to measure, it's hard to prove. 
And I don't know if we're going to see any employment tribunals from people because how do you prove that you didn't get the job because of the AI tool that was in the first stage of CV screening? I don't know how we do this. And if anybody has answers, come talk to me in the break or afterwards because I would love to know what we can realistically do. Now, machine learning developers and companies can adopt some of this. And this is where talking to people like yourselves, to the communities of high data, the machine learning engineers around the world, to say there are actually great frameworks out there you can, you know, if you've got a PyTorch model, you just stick a little uh, debiasing head on the end and it will try and maintain performance but drop the unfairness using things like the uh, statistical parity difference metric. Maybe there is a role for government here. Like, I actually really think there's a lot that government could do, but it's about what they want to and when. And uh, that, you know, sets up Andreas quite nicely. Uh, but I do think even softer uh, initiatives, uh, we can steal from the world of cybersecurity where you can become accredited with things like Cyber Essentials. If you want to work with government, you have to get this accreditation. And you have to document all the processes that you've baked into your company and organizational culture that make you a safer company from a cyber security point of view. So we could have this. We could have a, an AI Essentials. Uh, that is a requirement for AI machine learning development organizations working with the government. They can't change the world of industry, but maybe they can at least change people who are working with government to debias or make government systems fairer in the way that we work. So that's a pathway, and, I, and I, I know that these are initiatives being worked on. There are AI standards, there's the world of AI assurance, uh, there are ISO standards currently being developed looking at this. But honestly, does anybody care? This is why I'm, again, talking to you today. Uh, I'd love to know uh, what are the people that, that think uh, maybe there's a problem here, and uh, what do we do about it? Um, we saw that ChatGPT 3.5 selected Asian women 2.3 TMs more often than black men. Like, that's quite a big disadvantage from having exactly the same skills. Like, you're definitely swimming upstream there for that particular role. And our other research suggested that age discrimination is so much worse than that. Uh, and as this becomes baked into the LLMs, then I think we're going to see a world where there's a lot of benefits. You can see the benefits because it saves you time to use these systems. Uh, but the downsides are all insidious, they're hidden, they're very hard to measure, very hard to actually combat. So, in closing, despite all of this, uh, at least in America, the research suggests that uh, people think AI is still better than humans, ish, 50-50, ish. Um, so I don't know, like, maybe you aren't treating everyone the same if you're just systemically biasing against one protected group. But also, I, I don't really think this is a great solution, but it does look like increasingly people are changing their names on their CVs because they know it's more likely to get them hired. But this is cannot be the world that we're entering into, especially because you can't change the other stuff in your CV that indicates your protective characteristics. So it's really not that simple in a world of pain. So if you'd like to learn more about this and uh, follow us on our journey, uh, we've created a newsletter. It's Fairness Tales, fairnesstales.com. Uh, just documenting our journey and our research and other events will be uh, shared there as well. So we're not really sure how you improve this slightly terrifying future. We do know what the scale of the problem is, and again, that's what we'll be able to publish in a month or two's time. Uh, but in the meantime, come along with us for this ride, and if you have any great ideas about other things that could be done to improve the world and make it safer for all, then come and let us know. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker of the evening, uh, Andreas Varoxos, who will be giving a talk on measuring bias and impact in gut AI. Yeah, please give me a warm round of applause. Can you switch on mine to, or should I just take yours? Grand. Hey everyone, uh, thank you all for coming. Very exciting. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed John's incredibly pretty slides and incredibly well prepared presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, John used to work for Apple, where they have people like Steve Jobs who shout at you if you make bad slides. Uh, I work for the government. Uh, I do not have people like Steve Jobs. Uh, I do have sometimes bosses who shout me for my bad slides. Uh, but no offense, that's not you lot. So these slides have maybe not as nice as John's. Uh, but we're going to try and make it fun interactive. Uh, we're going to try and make it interesting. And I hope you find it interesting. Uh, and I'll take you through hopefully some interesting stories and tidbits uh, of various bits and bobs. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, my name is Andreas. I work at the data science team at number 10 and the incubator for AI. We work in central government, essentially building AI for parts of the UK government uh, that sort of the PM and his team care about. 
We're currently in a bit of a transition. We're moving out of number 10 to the Department of Science, which is why I'm sort of more i.ai focused now, but I spent the last couple of years doing a bunch of cross-gov AI stuff uh, and met uh, John and Xu and people in a field and we thought we should all go talk about bias together and hence this has all come together. Um, if you want to know more about AI, I recommend just going to ai.gov.uk. We have our website with all our projects and a blog post and we try and be wonderful and transparent and all those good things. Uh, so yes, if you have plenty of questions, worth having a browse afterwards. Uh, and frankly, you can download our code and run it yourself and have a good time. Uh, please don't criticize it too much. Although if you want to submit a PR, go nuts, that'll make me happy. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, my background before I came to central government was climate justice. So I uh, worked in policing, I did a lot of work in terms of statistical modeling and criminal justice and sort of risk forecasting. Uh, and I think that is quite a good place to start when you talk about AI and machine learning because that is where a lot of these models sort of started. It's sort of a key application that a lot of people are familiar with and have seen. And as we all know, there was an awful lot of bias in those spaces. So I think it's not a bad place to start if you want to think about it. Um, we'll use that to go into a little bit about how government is thinking about AI assurance and bias more broadly and how we're tackling it. Uh, then I'll take you through a few examples of the sort of projects we've been working on and how that's led to our how it's led to our sort of thinking around bias more generally. Uh, so first, I'm not going to go too far into the history of machine learning and stuff, but I wanted to start with this to point out that uh, I'm not going to be a finicky about what is and isn't AI. Uh, right now, I'm sort of throwing in machine learning into the sort of AI bias phase. Uh, if it's fancier than statistical modeling, I'm calling it AI for the purpose of this. So everything that is using fancy statistical models and above to do prediction and risk forecasting, uh, where there is an awful lot of bias, we're counting it. And I wanted to start by talking about random forests because they are in many ways the sort of OG implementation of machine learning and predictive forecasting in the risk and crime world. And again, just like John, I think it's worth mentioning just how long ago this was. Like I know 2001 doesn't feel very long ago to some of us, uh, but like, you know, this was a while back, right? This was before, you know, GPUs still had weird pictures of clowns on them and we didn't know how things worked and we were still in XP, was it XP, 99, whichever one it was. We were a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, but we were still doing some really cool things. And this stuff is still in many ways state of the art when it comes to sort of what we call tabular learning, which is, you know, if you've got a set of details about people, their age, their date of birth, their postcode, and you're trying to forecast whether or not they will offend, which is a key question in mass criminal justice, these models are still state of the art and still being used in a lot of ways. So a lot of the problems that are here still apply today. Uh, Pop quiz, who here is familiar with random forest models and has a vague idea of how they work? Hands up. Good, okay, about half, half. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick sort of explanation. Essentially, who's played a choose your own adventure book before? That was maybe optimistic of me, fewer than I thought, but it's okay. You've seen them, hopefully, you know, you go, you're fighting goblins. If you wanna swing your sword, go to page 30. If you wanna run away, go to page 27. Uh, you do that, and then if you wanna do another thing, you go to the next stage. Oh, that might laser doesn't work, there you go. And you go down, you go down, you go down. And essentially random forests work on the same principle, which is if you want to predict whether somebody is going to offend, first you might look at how old are they? If, you know, if they're over 65, they might not. If they're under 65, they might do. Then you can look at their marital status. Then you can look at their postcode. And based on that, they might go down a series of trees until you reach your conclusion. And that is just a single tree. And random forest will take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trees, aggregate them all, make them all vote, and cut a long story short, use that to make a prediction. That's simplifying it, but that's the general gist of it. There's a very nice little animation I stole from someone on YouTube. If you fancy, you can go up to the whole thing. There you go. Essentially, that's how they work, and these are still being used today in a lot of forecasting in terms of sort of risk and stuff like that. Uh, so as you saw initially, that sort of first paper came out in sort of early 2000s. That's when sort of random forest started hitting the big leagues, a lot of implementations and some pretty basic stuff. But by 2010, people had already started using them in machine learning forecasting within RISC. Uh, Jeff Barnes led a lot of work on this stuff, and Jeffrey Hyatt. Jeff is now head criminologist in the Met Police, ironically, and still does some really, really interesting work. Uh, so again, this stuff is still very, very recent, right? We're not that far. And the first sort of big case you might have seen is in Philadelphia probation. So this was uh, offenders would go to court, the judge would go, am I going to grant you bail, yes or no? And there'd be a machine learning model that would look at how many offenses they've done in the past, their age, their date of birth, etc., 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 and based on that, we'll try and make a prediction within the next two years, are they likely to offend again? And if so, should you or should you not grant them bail, right? Uh, you can all see where this is going. There is risk of bias all over this sort of thing. 
But, you know, this was before the whole explosion of us all thinking about bias all the time, right? This was a long time ago. Um, and what they looked at instead was how well did it do? And not only how well did it do, but how well did it do in a previous sample? And for all intents and purposes, as far as I could tell, it worked really well. So I think the, the headline figures are, in the entire data set of people they looked at, which I think was 40,000, just under 10% would go on to commit another serious offence within two years, and 40% of the people that the model would forecast would go to go on to commit offences would actually confirm. So that's a precision recall. I forget which one it is. Either way, they thought the model did pretty well. Like right? they looked at the model and went, right, it's doing a better job than we'd expect. Fantastic. If we look back over the historical data, the model is doing a good enough job of predicting risk and forecasting. Fabulous. We have a model that works. It's going to help people. It's going to stop people getting murdered. Isn't this great? Wonderful. Good stuff. Um, and the world moved on, right? Uh, and actually, it's relatively recently that this stuff started hitting the UK, um, at least in sort of the relatively open, transparent way. So this is a model called the Durham Heart Model. It was implemented in Durham Police in 2018, so again, really quite recent. Uh, again, a lot of the same authors that you see from those 2011 papers, very similar approach, random forest models. This one was not applied in court, but instead applied in police custody. So how it would work is, if you get arrested, what will tend to happen is a police officer will have a look at you, or you know, they'll deal with you the offence, and then at the end of the offence, they'll decide, right, do we, assuming you've done something wrong, do we send you to go to court by yourself? Do we send you home and go, right, come back to court next week, thank you very much? Or do we say, right, I do not trust that you will come back to court, you are a flight risk, we're going to keep you locked away until you do that. And so what they did was a model that would try and predict, are you going to commit another serious violent offence within the next six months? Again, very similar approach, very similar problem space. What they did that was quite interesting, unlike, unless they didn't just look at how did this work previously. What they instead did was they ran it as what we call a shadow system. So every time a custody sergeant would try and predict, am I going to let this person go or not? They would also run the machine learning model in the background and be able to get an exact comparison of for every person over the course of the however many months it ran, did the person think they were going to offend? Did the machine learning model think they were going to offend? And how did they compare? So they weren't just looking at, is it doing a good job? They were doing, is it doing a good job compared to the people who are doing it currently, right? Uh, and actually, all things considered, it did an okay job. So, it, you know, 53.8% uh, of people compared to 52%. Uh, doesn't sound very impressive, but it outdid police officers, right? So if that's all the offenders, uh, the AI model got about 54% of them right compared to police officers who got over 52%. So relatively small difference, but difference nonetheless, outperforms police officers. We have a model that works, even though it doesn't work fantastically, right? But the point where this gets interesting is it doesn't just look at the aggregate. Where they started looking was how does that break down? Uh, and what they looked at was for the highest risk offenders, so for the offenders who are likely to commit serious violent offenses, not just any offenses, how does that compare? And what you notice there, you start seeing a difference. So the model, the heart model, predicted those really, really well, so it got 90% of those accurate, accurate right, right for those highest harm offenders, compared to only about 80% for those police officers. And again, this is a small population, right? This is a smaller population, I think it's about 20% of the sample. So again, for that smallest population of highest harm, the AI model had a really noticeable increase over time compared to police officers. Um, and this is the point that I think is worth noticing, is that you start seeing not just is the model performing well, you get, is it performing well against the people who are already doing it? And then how is it performing well on certain subgroups? For now, the subgroup is serious offenders versus not. But as I'm sure you see where this is going, you then can start getting to all sorts of other things. Where does it perform well? Where does it not? And how does that impact all sorts of other wonderful things? Uh, yeah, not to scare, apologies. Uh, now, the good news is policing had actually started thinking about this quite a lot, which I think is nice, right? You know, they weren't just writing papers. They wrote this really cool model, which would all go care which is what you should think about when developing a machine learning model within the context of policing. And you can see that it actually puts some really thoughtful principles around it, right? So it has to be laws for it, it has to be explanatory, you have to understand it, you have to be able to challenge it, it has to be accurate, responsible, explainable. All. all these words that we are now very familiar with, but you know, in 2017, a lifetime ago, this was pretty new and I think actually pretty, you know, pretty impressive that people actually articulated a lot of this stuff. However, you will notice it doesn't say bias, it doesn't say disproportionality, right? It's, it, it's a very much focused around explainability and sort of ignores the bias point quite intentionally. Uh, not intentionally, but you know, it just, just does. It's not a thing they thought about as much as time. Uh, but this was coming to the era we are now much more familiar with where machine learning bias was a thing we were all thinking about an awful lot more often. And it really hit the sort of criminal justice space when uh, in 2017, uh, I want to say ProPublica, which is a US publication, looked at Compass. 
Uh, COMPASS is a system that 99% of people will not have encountered before. It stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. This is a very posh word, but essentially says if you were in court in the US, the judge would have a nice model that would say, is this person likely to offend or not? And based on that, they could make you eligible for lesser sanctioning. So, you know, the US has this bail system with money, e.g. if they think that you're going to offend, you're not going to offend. Uh, and so if the model said you were lower risk, they'd be less likely to put any harm. And again, similar to this before, the model had been validated with just like the first model we saw. The model had been validated on previous answers. And they said, look, compared to the historical data, the model performs quite well. We're happy with it. It does a good job. Uh, but as we remember, the challenge is not just overall. The challenge is when you start getting to granularity. Uh, and when this team of researchers started looking at how it worked on individual ethnic groups, what they noticed was it was wrong consistently for certain ethnic groups. So for instance, I mean, I'll let you read the thing, but essentially black defendants, it was far more likely to get wrong, and not only to get wrong, it was likely to get wrong in the way that it thought it made them far less. Essentially, black defendants were penalized pretty substantially, uh, and white defendants had the other way around, right? Uh, now, I don't need to say to you, this is an obvious problem, right? This is not okay, we need to do something about this sort of thing. Uh, and. This is kind of where a lot of the thing, you know, the thing is really radicalized a lot of thinking around criminal justice AI. And it starts thinking, you know, how can we start accounting for all these problems? And now I think that we are in a far better place where people start measuring a lot of these things. Uh, and if any of you have read Invisible Number, Invisible Women, Invisible Women, yeah, Invisible Women by Christina, someone shout us the name, I don't know what it is, the book, Invisible Women. Go read Invisible Women. Uh, she did some really interesting work, which is essentially, if you are measuring an, argu an algorithm, you should measure it and break it down on a group by group basis, because the overall will be hiding negative effects in the individuals. Uh, put it simply, you know, you can, if you run a crash test dummy only with men, just because it works fantastically with men, it does mean it will work with women, etc., etc., etc. which is why this subgroup analysis can hide really negative effects, and why it's really important. Um, but one point worth making is, these, as John highlighted, these biases don't appear out of nowhere. They are reflections of an awful lot of things that ingest from our data set. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I thought it's one point worth highlighting. Uh, there's been some really interesting research done, which is you give police officers or member of the public a map, and you ask them, please draw on this map where you think there is crime in your local area. Uh, members of the public think they've got a decent idea. Police officers are convinced they are absolutely right. They're like, ah, I've got, I know, give me a crayon, I'll mark it all out fantastically and they will draw out a wonderful map of where crime is in their area, uh, and then you can compare it with the actual crime stats and see how it compares. Uh, inevitably, nearly everyone is wrong, of course, but noticeably, people are wrong in really interesting ways. And essentially, people to be, tend to, the areas where people are most likely to overestimate crime tend to be, over, tend to be focused on areas of depredation, areas that tend to overestimate ethnic minorities, and a whole bunch of other problems, right? So you can see how these problems interact reinforce problems that sort of appear once can appear again and again and again and these reflections of reality can be fed into your machine learning models and start causing you all sorts of weird and multiple problems which is why just getting a model that is better is not enough right you need to think not only is it better is it better for everyone who is it penalizing who is it causing problem for just going better is fine and getting better is important but you know there, there is a risk that by getting better you are hiding negative effects in there uh, for who, which groups, blah, blah, blah. Who are you, who, what effects might you getting lost in the noise? And the important thing here is especially when it comes to interaction effects, right? So we've already discussed how these models are getting more and more complicated, right? Not only are you now looking at age and ethnicity and location, and all these models, the more complicated they get, the more likely you are to have to have interactions that interact in that space. So, you know, not only is, oh, what is your skin color, but where is your postcode? Where do you live? How about if you are a young boy who lives in this part of the UK that happens to have this parent. You know, there are loads and loads of subgroups, and I guess it's a, re it's a really challenging part for a lot of us, right? How many of these do we measure? How do we, how do we know we've done a good job is where it gets really, really difficult. Uh, yeah, this, this stuff is getting increasingly more difficult, and there's only so many analysis you can do, and it gets really challenging. Now, the good news is, the government's thought about this an awful lot. I will say, by the way, Please don't put this on the internet and say the man from the government said this. I have winged this a little bit. These slides did not exist six hours ago. I will get into a lot of trouble if this ends up on the newspaper. So please don't say anything inappropriate and I will do my best to do the same. But lots of my colleagues have thought an awful lot about uh, how to make AI models safe. Uh, and the good news is they've been really transparent and really open. Uh, if you fancy it, there are some really interesting ones that are worth looking at. So the Department for Science has written an AI assurance framework. There is a generative AI framework for the UK government. Uh, every UK government institution that has an algorithm 
defined out how you will, should now be recording it and publishing it. And part of that recording will now include some really interesting questions around how have you compared bias? How is it performing? How is it drifting over time? In theory, quite soon, we should have a nice central log of all these questions and making sure that people are being transparent, open, and doing all those important things. And that, that, I know there was a blog we've written that looks at how we are doing it in Idle AI. Uh, I won't read it all in detail, but essentially we we like to have a set of principles we follow when we do this sort of thing. We like to make sure things are safe, transparent, fair, open, and accountable, which is why we sort of make sure all our code is open source and all that good stuff and let's just do it. Um, but uh, that stuff is really difficult, right? Like, you know, as I've said, the more and more models you have and the deeper your models are, the more interactions you have, the more challenging it is to try and account for everything. There's only so many arguments you can try and do. And so what we try and do is right now is trying to think about how we can do a sort of proportionate attitude to that risk, right? So if we have just got a model that we are testing internally with 10 people on the start internally, we probably don't need to be quite so massively robust. Um, how is it likely to impact people, right? If you have a model that is going to be having meaningful impacts on hundreds of people, even if it's small, you should probably be impacting it. And the last one, which isn't sort of on our list, but I thought was worth pointing out, because to me it's the important one in the criminal justice space, what is the sort of status quo, right? And again, it goes back to policing and crime. Policing and crime, believe it or not, quite racist. There's, uh, like, you know, structural inequality, there are a lot of racial biases in there. And so, so trying to account for what the basic situation is and how, what impact you're having and all your potential to do good is quite an important thing for us to account for. Um, so in terms of that, that's sort of defining how we're trying to do our evaluation. And this stuff is really difficult. So what we're trying to do essentially, as we move to AI models that are more and more complex, we're having to be more and more innovative in terms of how we measure things. And hopefully I want to show you how we're doing that a bit now. Uh, but essentially we're having to hire teams of researchers. So Idle AI now has an internal, internal evaluation as insurance team. They are not all like machine learning specialists. Some of them are you know, used to evaluate uh, things like education, like policing, and their job is to check how well things are performing and also things like bias and insurance. And they are studying a whole bunch of really weird and interesting evaluations, all the way from randomized trials like I showed you earlier to more interesting examples, which I will quickly highlight. Uh, so quickly gonna show you one of the products which I think is worth discussing. So this is Caddy. This is something we built with Citizens Advice uh, down in Manchester. It's an AI co-pilot for customer service advisors. Uh, so it uses large language models like ChatGPT. You ask it a question. This is intended for advisors at Citizens Advice. Uh, and it will then go generating a really nice answer based off their internal documentation, based off Gov UK guidance. And it will then generate that in the background based on their source of documentation. Uh, it will return that to a supervisor first and foremost. So the supervisor can go and check it's correct. Uh, and as long as the supervisor is happy, as long as the supervisor goes right, I've read that through, I'm happy it's all correct. If they want, they can put a few notes saying, look, I'm not happy it's incorrect, blah, 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 blah. But as long as they validate it, that answer will then go back to the original advisor who can feed it back to the person, etc. And hopefully, we're kind of hoping that as we move on, this sort of thing can improve how quickly people talk get advice from organizations like Citizens Advice and also government. Um, now, the good news is, Caddy is uh, like those evaluations, like those risk models we showed you earlier, we can test it in quite a traditional way. And that's what we did. So Caddy was tested through a randomized control trial. We've been testing it since January this year. We tested it, I think, between January and end of April. Uh, so thankfully, citizens advice were really helpful. They were open to randomizing it. So every time you called or asked for an appointment with citizens advice in Manchester, uh, you would always go to an advisor no matter what happened. But if that advisor asked for help, Sometimes that advisor, that request would go straight to a supervisor, and sometimes that, advice, that request for help would first go to Caddy, and Caddy would try and generate an AI response, right? Uh, and then we can try and look at those impacts and try and see what impact it had. And at the end of every single one of those calls, we started by surveying the supervisor and asking the supervisor, how did you feel in that call? Were you confident, were you not? Did you manage to resolve the query? We also looked at how long it took for them to resolve the query, so see if it went faster or slower. And then after that, we, we also sent a text message to the person who asked for help, asking, how did you get on? Did you get the answer you wanted? How do you feel after the interaction? And the hope is we should be able to link that up to demographic details, information details, and understand how does Caddy help, who does it help, and where does it help, right? and start getting understanding about those biases, which is really exciting. Uh, and the good news is we had some really promising initial results on those surveys. So uh, where Caddy was being used by the advisors, 80% of the answers were being approved, which is good news. So that AI model can do a decent job of generating answers. Uh, advisors were twice as likely to say they were confident in giving advice. Again, good news. Uh, and 
they were more likely to say that they resolved the advice the query of the person correct. So everything looks like where caddy is available, you answer faster and you give better answers. Fa yeah, you give better answers, answer faster? Yeah, something like that. Either way, better, it looks like it worked, which is fine. But you'll notice I haven't talked about the text messages here, which is what we were trying to get the bias data from. Uh, now, it's gonna be a bit of a pop quiz moment. Uh, this here is our random assignment uh, of who got assigned to treatment and control during our trial. Uh, and you will notice that something strange happened very early on. Can anybody guess why people stopped moving from treatment to control early on in our trial? Or when someone shout out something. Hodlis is not a bad one, but no. Okay, I'll give you a hint. How it worked is at the end of every call, what it would do, would, it would say, your call is now complete. If you want to move to your next call, hit yes. If not, if you want to ask another call in the same series, just stay here. Do you think people hit the, I want to be done with my call and get re-randomized and risk not getting access to caddy? No. Quite quickly, people realized that if they said, once they had access to the AI tool, as long as they didn't finish the call, they would keep access to the AI tool. And they could keep using it, as long as they did not say, my call is over, I'd like to move on to the next call, please. And as long as they used it on the same query, they could keep going, keep going, keep going. And it took me three weeks to realize, no one's finishing calls. What's going on? Uh, and I mean, it's not their fault, right? I mean, you know, they had options, they were, they were like, if I don't hit no, then I keep getting the really cool AI thing that I'm really enjoying. And if I hit yes, sometimes I just get the really sad message that says, I'm really sorry, we can't help you right now. Please try again next time. Uh, and so for the first like six weeks, People were just never ending that first call. Uh, and because of that, we had a really, really weird set of data sets. Uh, now on one side, great news. People liked it, right? People really liked it. They fought my system incredibly hard. Uh, but obviously, this kind of impacts the validity of my results. Uh, what we ended up having to do is at the end of those six weeks, we put in a, a time block. So essentially, after everyone, every like 15 minutes at the end of your call, you'd be like, are you sure you're still on the call? Are you really still on the call? Please said no. And thankfully, as you can see after that, we sort of started evaluating it. Uh, but obviously, this kind of impacted a lot of our results. Uh, and it meant that a lot of the text message surveys and stuff we wanted to send out didn't get sent out, which is a real shame because it means we don't have that bias data, right? And that's kind of the point I want to make, which is evaluating this stuff is really hard. Uh, people really want it, and trying to get enough data and enough granularity to understand your impact on bias, especially when you think about the limitations of our personal data, right, and actually try to vulnerable people, is really, really challenging things to do, which is why for now, we only have sort of relatively initial survey-based data, but there is an awful lot more to do, and hopefully we're hoping to run the RCT in the next sort of few months, and I'd really hope by then we can start understanding whether we have disproportionate effects on geography, on demography, and all that sort of important things. Um, I'm going to discuss one other AI tool because I think it's a good example of how these things can actually also be really tricky. Um, has anyone here answered a government consultation before? Again, really niche. I'm getting really niche nerdy advice over here, but I'm doing it. Someone at the back said yes. What consultation did you answer? Um, I think it was from statistics. I mean, it's, it's about there, usually that exciting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, whenever government uh, does a change in legislation or a bunch of other things, we have a legal duty to consult, which is ask people, what do you think about me doing this? You know, it's a democracy, it's all well and good, it's quite important we do this sort of thing. So say we were going to, you know, change how we deal with your buses or your thing. You know, essentially we have really big surveys, we send out a bunch of emails, we put news on the internet, we say, if you care about this, complete the survey, please reach out to us, write a letter, and we'll analyze it and we'll see what people think. That way, if we do something really stupid and we haven't thought it through, we should be able to tell and we should be able to identify that actually there's a big group of people here we hadn't thought about, we should be careful doing this sort of thing. Uh, now consultations are great, but they are very, very time intensive, right? So some consultations will have 40,000 responses. That's 40,000 responses that a civil servant has to read over. I do not need to tell you that takes quite a lot of time. Uh, and AI, turns out, can do some of this stuff, right? AI is actually quite good at summarizing it. It's quite good at sort of reading articles through. And so quite early on, one of the use cases we had was, can we use AI to automate consultations, right? Can we start actually reading things at pace, taking some of those massive surveys and start reading through them? And we built a prototype quite quickly. So this is Consult. Uh, you can essentially see what it does. It takes all those surveys in, does what's called relatively simple topic modeling, aggregates them, try and extract themes, details, reads them through, 
and based on that tries to do some reading. Uh, by the way, I should have said, it says official sensitive, that's because I prepared my slides last minute and I did not realize it. It's not official sensitive. Again, please don't tell the mail that I show you the sensitive stuff, but I did not, and that's not my fault. I'm just bad at slides. Uh, so yeah, it does that. Then it, this is a slide that we keep showing because people think it looks cool. I think we should maybe should put it in the bin, but at the same time, it does kind of, sh it, what it essentially tries to show is how these AI models work, right? And John kind of showed you those embeddings previously, but essentially how AI models work is for every single word or construct they have, they put them in a big massive mind palace in their brain, and if things are close to each other, they like to think they're related. That's kind of the gist of it, right? And that's essentially how these topic models work. So these models here, these, these might be words, right? And one word might be fire engine, and one word might be extinguisher, right? And because of that, they'll be close by. Now, a traditional search like Google, well, Google that, like Google five years ago, if you'd said, find me a fire engine, wouldn't have found you a fire extinguisher. But if you do a topic model, which is sort of the embedding technology that powers some of these AI models, it will understand that if you say fire engine, that's a little bit similar to extinguisher. Or for instance, if you search for, uh, if you want to find legislation on vaping, and you go to legislation.gov.uk website and search vaping, you won't find anything because there's not really much about vaping. But there is things about smoking, and this is how these sort of things work, and they aggregate them together, and they try and search them for you. But the question is, how do you evaluate this stuff, right? How do you check this stuff is A, working, B, fair? It's actually a really difficult thing to do because we can't, we can't randomly allocate consultations to people. That would be problematic, and we'd have lots and lots of consultations to do. Uh, and then what do you actually measure in, right? This stuff is actually really quite difficult. And this comes back to the fact that we've tried to hire people who can think on their feet and try and design things on the flow to try and do this. Uh, and they've been thinking quite hard about how they've been doing this sort of thing. Oh, this comes back to the fact that, you know, again, it's essentially kind of how we try and, yeah, it's quite difficult. Um, we started, well, so what we've started by doing is we've looked at historical consultations. And we've started looking at, like, look, how does an AI generate topics? How does it compare to a human topic? What proportion of those themes match the human ones? And how much do they agree in the whole, right? So which is, you know, a decent starter for 10. We're looking at the previous topic and looking at that compare. And the good news is that looks like it sort of works. Um, but the good news, the bad news is we're not looking at bias yet, right? The bias is still, but there is bias in there. And we're starting to think about now, but again, you know, how do we measure the bias? How, just because the human agrees, is that okay? Just because it used, just because it works the way it used to work before, is that an acceptable baseline to think about? And it's something we're starting to think about now. How do we measure not just performance compared to a human, but performance compared just like, what does good look like in this space? And it's actually a really difficult thing to do, and we're trying to think about it quite hard. Uh, we haven't quite got that yet. Uh, yeah. Um, oh yeah, the other thing, of course, is like, how much should we be replacing existing systems versus making something new entirely, right? Like, consultations exist because a good way of asking people what they thought was sending them all along survey and then completing the survey and they'd come back and talk about it, right? Uh, but that's not the world we're in anymore. We're in a world of AI LM models and we are in a world of messages and Twitter and all that sort of exciting stuff. You know, a lot of people are saying you should be thinking to not just replacing odd models but changing them entirely. And then you get into a whole different space. How much bias are you baking in there? I don't even know, but it's quite a difficult thing. Uh, there's a really interesting organization. Some of you might have seen them here before. Uh, you know, so the Taiwan Digital Ministry have done really interesting work in this space with tools like Polis, which let you essentially have these giant group conversations and try and pull out what is meaningful, what is similar. But again, like, you know, how, it's really difficult to know how well these things work, let alone how much bias they're baking in. Um, so just to finish off, I'm gonna finish on one little thing because I think it's a good example of just how complex a lot of these things are being and just how difficult it is to get it right. Um, and I appreciate I've turned up here and mostly said, we're thinking about it, but we haven't got the answer. But I think sadly, that's kind of where a lot of this stuff is. Um, some of you might have seen this headline a few weeks ago. Uh, police officers, there is a bunch of software now that is letting police officers write reports automatically uh, and people are starting buying them. I don't think anybody in the UK has bought them yet, which, to be honest, I think is probably not a bad thing because I haven't seen any reports on evaluations, but they've started happening, which is quite interesting. Um, and I think this is, like, this is such a good example of where the bias comes in and how complex models can work. So, uh, this is a scenario we put together looking at how uh, different topics might affect your forecast of risk. So we ask an AI model on a scale from like zero to four, where zero is four is this person is in a lot of trouble, we need to help them now, to zero to this person's totally fine, we don't need to worry about it. And we said, look, what essentially, how do different AI models perceive different levels of risk? How does it change over time? What affects them? Um, and essentially, we changed all these words and on every single word you change, the mod different models have totally different perceptions of risk. 
right? So if you take ChatGPT 3.5, you take ChatGPT 4, if you take Anthropic, they all have really different perceptions of risk. And again, thinking back to those interactions, that's when it gets really interesting. If you tell it you are a police officer in London and you are asking this question, it will have one view of risk. If you tell it you're a police officer in Birmingham, it will have a different view of risk. And all these models interact. And then you get into the difficult space of like, should government not ever release an AI tool unless it's checked every single possible iteration? Uh, you know, this stuff is really difficult. I don't think we've got it right, but we're thinking about it an awful lot and we're trying to hire a lot of really good people to start measuring it and evaluating it and building AI models that are as far as we can make them safe, assured, trustworthy, impactful, and transparent. Uh, so if you want to come do that, come ask me for a job afterwards, after the spending review. Uh, but yeah, so if, you know, again, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but we've, we've started thinking about it an awful lot and we've started testing things and we're pretty optimistic about it. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much.